about 20 to 30 wear adjustable frames to take with him. In 1996, Lawrence, Joshua and development worker Michael Wills took the glasses to Ghana. Over the course of a three-week trial, the spectacles were offered to needy cases. It was interesting for me to see hands-on, to take a device that I had, as it were, created, put it in someone's hands, let them use it and see that it had an immediate benefit. One thing that sticks in my mind was um, we went to a village, Mayera, and we met a tailor, Henry Ajay Mensa, who was an interesting chap, an extremely nice chap, very engaging, but he was beginning to find it difficult to actually work because he, he couldn't see clearly without near vision correction. And we put a pair of glasses on him. The effect was quite dramatic because immediately, you know, within a, a minute or so, he was able to start working accurately again. They also remember a woman called Margaret who was in an um, adult literacy class who was, was absolutely delighted that she was given glasses and she was then able to read, um, see clearly a page, I think for the first time. We made the device, taken it out into the field and showed that it worked technically. And then, then that row, that produced a challenge. The next stage was to take the device as we had it and actually turn it into a mass production product which was made to high quality at low cost to solve this particular problem. With development expert Michael Wills on board, Joshua set up a company to meet the challenge of producing glasses on a large scale. Hello, Adaptive Eye Care, Michael Wills. Oh, hello, good afternoon, how are you? Mm -hmm. To keep the cost to a minimum, the company directors are exploring the most efficient way to produce the glasses. Anyone who looks at, at the technology and understands what it's about will appreciate that for it to be applied effectively will require very large numbers of glasses to be produced. So, you know, we're going to have rather a large operation. Large operation means large costs. Josh has invested half a million pounds on developing and patenting his technology, and he'd like to see a return. The glasses won't be given away, but they will be sold cheaply, wholesaling at about $10, just over six pounds. People everywhere have some money. There's no problem as I see it, with people paying something um, for getting vision correction. Uh, it's just that uh, you don't, they wouldn't, it's not, doesn't seem to me fair to make them pay more than they can afford. Not only is it not fair, but also by and large they won't get correction. So there's a balance there. As you take the thing into production, what happens is if you make one or two devices, they're very expensive. If you make some thousands, the cost falls. If you make some millions, the cost falls even further. When we get into full production, the, the, scale, of, the scale that we'll be producing in is, is immense. And actually, we don't think that the, in the optical industry there's is anything like this has ever, ever been tackled. So we actually have to work with suppliers and, uh, and, and factories that we've identified and we're going to have to work in partnership with these people because we've got to develop new ways of doing things. Okay, so it's a bit sort of busier for the weekend, otherwise I would have finished. With a business plan in place, the company started the tricky task of getting backing in the UK and abroad. But to ensure the integrity of the business, the investors would need to be vetted to check they were driven by the same principles as Joshua and his colleagues. I've had venture capitalists screaming down the phone at me, saying things like, this is a wonderful new technology and it should be developed in um, um, the, the West. And, uh, you know, and um, sometimes, in fact, they speak as if they already own it. We are really trying to do something within our little company which is somewhat different from uh, what is done by many, um, as it were, early stage startup companies because our technology is specifically aimed in the first instance at the developing world. 
the rather dodger end of the commercial world actually think that people from university backgrounds and boffins and so on don't know much about money and commerce and, they, and that they can actually get control of technologies in this way. They don't understand that technology takes a long time to develop and they're, they're often, their agenda is different. They're looking for, often looking for a quick profit. The real danger with allowing uh, characters like that to come into a project, if you look at it, is that um, the control of the thing, so the application in the, in the developing world, comes into question. None of us really understand that, do we? No. As a scientist, Joshua has learnt the patience to wait for results. He started this piece of atomic research in the 70s, and although he's been working on it for over 25 years, there's still more work to do. Public conception of invention and people shouting Eureka and 10 minutes later there's a product on the market. That, that with, with technology, that is very rarely the way. It's a long process, and you have to be prepared to take it through its cycles will put obstacles in my way, I move around them. I just keep moving forward. The team has managed to raise millions of pounds for the project and hopes to start production soon. On a personal level, Joshua has received good publicity for his spectacles in the United States, and this has opened up new opportunities. The plan currently is to manufacture the mass-produced item in the USA, but this is largely because the funding for the device is American. And um, also that there are areas of the states which are where if you want to um, create and implement a new technology quickly, there are areas of the USA, especially California, where this is the norm, this is what is done. You know, you go there and you do things like that. In Britain, um, you tend not to find that that, is, that sort of thing happens, at least from my experience. So why swim against the tide? With much of the profits heading stateside, it's an all too familiar tale of a brilliant British invention having to go abroad to get made. It's always the same that the UK is a very inventive nation. We come up with the ideas. Actually, we're not very innovative, which means that we don't get those ideas into the marketplace. Wherever they set up, there's a lot of work to do. The challenges that lie ahead are immense, really, because as a manufacturer, I find it quite easy to make 5,000 spectacle frames. Um, it's what we do, what I've done all, you know, every day of my life for the last 20 years. But now we're talking about something where we have to actually, by year three, our target for production is, is about a million units every four months. So the challenges are immense. And, uh, and uh, it's not only producing the frame, we have to have the lenses made, and we also have to have our pump syringes made and uh, it all has to be done in almost pharmaceutical conditions as well because it has to be extremely clean modern factory after all the hard work and planning they hope the glasses will finally be on the market in 2000 what has kept Joshua and his team going until now is the belief they can really do some good I don't think he would have been so committed to the project if it was just for himself at all I think the fact that so many people can benefit from this um, and, his, and his enthusiasm has spread to others. He has a team of people who have all given their time for nothing because they also believe it's such a worthwhile project. After 25, uh, maybe 30 years working in the optical profession uh, where we were making a product which is a fashion product, now I feel uh, that we're, we're, putting, we're making a product where we can put something back. There is a social agenda to what we're doing in the sense that uh, there is a huge unmet need for vision correction right across uh, the developing world, which this technology can address. N2 over N1 and 
And as for Joshua, he continues to juggle college life with developing his glasses. But for him, the struggle has undoubtedly been worthwhile. Scientists and inventors should actually solve problems for humanity if they can. I don't think they should just sort of keep their science in a box and not apply it.